saying I am chosen. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. I am chosen. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me. Say I am. Oh, I am a 
do, Lord, our one defense. We need you, Lord. We declare that with our lips. Father God, our hearts cry out to you tonight, and we thank you for who you are and your great love for us. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated this evening. Thank you, Carter and Krista, and Joy on the Keys for leading us in that short time of worship. Well, you're in for a rare treat tonight because William Federer is here, and I do want to give honor where honor is due, and I'd like to ask Pastor Josh and Lindsay Holland, would you stand over in the back? Because Josh and Lindsay pastor down in Centralia at Mountain View Baptist Church. Thank you, and, and if you are familiar with the Gateway family here, um, Josh is Evie, Evie Benedict's brother, okay? I almost called you Evie Holland. <laughs> so once upon a time, before she met the incredible Jacob, she was Evie Holland. And so Josh is Evie's older brother, and they passed her in Centralia, like I said, Mountain View Baptist Church. And so Josh has a connection with William Federer, and that's how um, he's had him at the church over the past few days. And in fact, William Federer has spoken on socialism in America, who is the king in America, and other topics over the past few days in Centralia. And tonight he'll be covering miracles in American history. Um, but also, we will have a short Q&A session here about midway through, and so if there's any pressing questions on your mind, you just got to ask him about something pertaining to socialism, democracy, a republic, American history, etc. That will be the opportunity for that. So I'm going to welcome you up here, Mr. Federer, and join me in welcoming him tonight. Right, there we go. Um, well, thank you so much, and I am very honored to be here with Pastor Adam and Gloria, and um, this has been a real treat for me to be invited to be up, and, and also to have been with uh, Josh and Lindsay down there at Mountain View Baptist Church. And um, so the, uh, I write history books, um, I've written about 25 books, um, but my wife has heard me speak for about 30 years, and she decided to pick out the best stories. And her definition of the best is, there's a crisis, they pray, things turn around. <laughs> She's like, get to the good part where things turn around. And so we uh, put together the book, and then it did so well, we did another volume. And we're thrilled. Um, D. James Kennedy Ministries, I don't know if you're familiar with that, uh, they decided to take the books and, and combine them and make a, a gift edition, hardback, with every page in color. I mean, it's really nice. And they just came out with it like a, a month ago, and so um, uh, I'm supposed to, I'm scheduled to do a raid, uh, an interview on the 700 Club on it, like in a couple weeks, so you can keep that in prayer. But, so I thought I'd share some of the stories with you, and um, the big picture is, uh, I spent several years researching every civilization that has ever existed on the planet, and so I go through uh, Nimrod Tower of Babel, and Gilgamesh, King of Uruk, and Sargon of Akkadia, and his, his pharaohs, and Caesars, and Kaisers, and Sultans, and Tsars, and I demonstrate that the most common form of government is a king. And the, uh, the king um, can rule more and more area because with military advancements, the kings can kill more people. And with technological advancements, the kings can track more people. And so the uh, you know, Vikings and Genghis Khan and then the king of Spain, France, and Austria. But finally, the king of England was the most powerful king on the planet. The sun never set on the British Empire. The king of England was a globalist. He was a one world government guy with him at the top. And uh, America's founders didn't like globalists. And they still don't. And so uh, we broke away from the king and um, had the Declaration of Independence. And the Declaration mentions God four times. Laws of nature and of nature's God. All men are created equal and they're endowed by their creator with unalienable rights. The king of England really didn't believe that all men were equal. He believed he was a little extra equal, right? The divine right of kings. And then appealing to the supreme judge of the world for the rectitude of our intentions. And that word appealing comes from the, uh, the concept of if you have a case and you lose, you appeal it. If you have a case, you lose, you appeal it again. What if you appeal to the supreme court? Why, well, what's the highest? Well, the, to them, it was the king of England. 
What if he doesn't give you justice? You go above his head. <laughs> you appeal it to God. You appeal it to the supreme judge of the world for our intentions. And then with a reliance on the protection of divine providence. So uh, in Europe, it was the creator king people. And with the declaration, we leave, it, leave out the king. And we say the creator gives all the rights and power to each person. We're all equal. And we choose our leaders from amongst ourselves. And um, so let's see here. So a copy of the Declaration was rushed out to George Washington, and he was in New York, and he had it read to his troops on July 9th, 1776. And, um, and then, believe it or not, the general uh, says this, the general hopes and trusts that every officer and man will endeavor, endeavor to live and act as becomes a Christian soldier, defending the dearest rights and liberties of his country. And so right after this, he's in New York, is the Battle of Brooklyn Heights. So, the British fill up the harbor with 400 ships, 32,000 British troops. They said that the harbor looked like a forest of trees because all of a sudden you have these wooden masts. And um, so the Continental Congress has a day of fasting. We earnestly recommend the 17th of May, 1776, be observed as a day of humiliation, fasting, and prayer that we may with united hearts confess and bewail our manifold sins and transgressions and by a sincere repentance and amendment of life appease God's righteous displeasure and through the merits and mediation of Jesus Christ obtain his pardon and forgiveness. This is the same Continental Congress that did the declaration and they're saying through the merits and mediation of Jesus Christ. And so Washington orders this day of prayer and fasting to be read to the troops, the Continental Congress having ordered Friday the 17th instant to be observed as a day of fasting, humiliation and prayer humbly to supplicate the mercy of Almighty God, that it would please him to pardon all our manifold sins and transgressions. The general commands all officers and soldiers to pay strict obedience to the orders of the Continental Congress, that by their unfeigned and pious observance of their religious duties, they may give, incline the Lord and give her a victory to prosper our arms. So we got Washington's in New York. He's got his troops there. They have the day of fasting, they rush the declaration, read to the troops, and then the harbor's filling up with all these ships, and suddenly it's looking really bad. <laughs> and Washington writes to his younger brother, John Augustine Washington, we expect a very bloody summer of it at New York. We are not either in men or arms prepared for it. If our cause is just, as I do most religiously believe it to be, the same providence which has in many instances appeared for us will still go on to afford us its aid. So we think bad, things are bad now. This is the most powerful nation in the world, Britain. And I mean, they control India, Australia, New Zealand, Hong Kong, and, and they're gonna attack us. And we just have a ragtag thrown together army. So it looks bad now. Well, it looked really bad then. And now Washington uses the word providence, right? He says uh, the same providence which has in many. So let's look up the definition. The 1828 dictionary says, defines providence, the care and superintendence which God exercises over his creatures. By divine providence is understood God himself. And so they would use these very respectful terms toward God and providence was one of them. So New York, um, the British find a loyalist. Now a loyalist is somebody that lives in America, but they're not loyal to America. They're loyal to the enemy. I know it's hard for us to imagine that type of person ever existed. Right? Somebody could live here, and they're not for. And so this loyalist shows the British where to land away from where George Washington is. And so the blue is the Americans, and the red is the redcoats. And so they land far away from where, Wa and Washington can't see them. And this loyalist shows the British how to go all night long through Jamaica Pass, and then attack George Washington from behind on the morning of August 27th, 1776. And Washington is totally caught off guard. There was this valley there, right there, right? There were some Americans that were on horseback and they were supposed to watch the valley for British troops. But the British Navy's out in the harbor. And so these guys are waiting and waiting, it's dark, and then they hear some troop movement. And they're like, what, what's this all about? And they, they, in the dark, they're riding along, and they come up and they, they say, yeah, it's been pretty quiet tonight. How about you guys? And they look over, and they're the British troops. 
And the British are like, uh, you're not going anywhere. Matter of fact, you're going to show us how to get through this pass. And anyway, so Washington had zero warning. And so they're attacked from behind. 3,000 Americans die. Only 300 British. It's the largest battle of the entire Revolutionary War, and it's the entire army. There's no second string somewhere that we can call. This is it. If we lose here, the war's over. And so Washington is watching 400 young men of the 1st Maryland Regiment, and they're charging right into the British line six times. They just regroup, keep charging. All of them die. And Washington's watching them from a distance. And he says, good God, what brave fellows I've lost this day. Ever since then, he'd always have the 1st Maryland Regiment be the first one to march in a parade out of his respect for their sacrifice. Anyway, so the, the Americans are fighting, they're losing, and then the, the sun goes down. And Washington is pinned up against the water. He was facing the water, thinking the British were going to attack from the water. He's attacked from behind, and now he's, he's pinned. He's got the water on one side, the British on the other. And he's probably thinking, well, the next day the British will catch me and hang me, and, um, and America will be another British colony like India. But no, he got every boat he can find, and he began to ferry his troops across the East River from Brooklyn Heights to Manhattan Island. And so they're doing it as quiet as they can, and um, he's moving the cannons, he's moving the horses, and it's like really quiet, and uh, he gets about half the army moved when the sun starts to come up. Now he's really a sitting duck. There's not enough left to fight, and they're strung out over this river. A couple cannonballs would disrupt that. And uh, his chief of intelligence was Major Ben Talmadge. And he writes, as the dawn of the next day approached, those of us who remained in the trenches became very anxious for our own safety. And when the dawn appeared, there were several regiments still on duty. At this time, a very dense fog began to rise off the river and seemed to settle in a peculiar manner over both encampments. I recollect this peculiar providential occurrence perfectly well, and so very dense was the atmosphere that I could scarcely discern a man at six yards distance. We tarried until the sun had risen, but the fog remained as dense as ever. So he's continuing to ferry all his troops across. He's on the last boat that leaves. When he gets away, it's around noon, the fog lifts, the British charge, no one's there. <laughs> it was the last chance the British had to capture the entire American army all at once. And uh, Washington uh, later writes, the hand of Providence has been so conspicuous in the course of the war that he must be worse than an infidel that lacks faith. But it will be time enough for me to turn preacher when my present appointment ceases, <laughs> when he's done being general. And um, so the British, they do capture New York. The Americans are chased uh, out. Uh, and then the British were going to come up New York, up the Hudson River Valley. And then some other British, uh, General Johnny Burgoyne, landed in Canada. And we're going to come down the Hudson River Valley, Lake Champlain and everything, Lake George. And then it was going to be this pincer movement. And, um, but the generals of the British didn't like each other, and they didn't want the other one to get credit. And so rather than coming up <laughs> the Hudson River, the one general takes his army and goes to try to capture Philadelphia. Because in British warfare, if you capture the enemy's capital, the war's over. He didn't realize that that didn't work over here. But anyway, so General Burgoyne is coming down from Canada thinking he's going to meet the British army coming up from New York, but there ain't no army. <laughs> but he doesn't know that. So it's called the Battle of Saratoga. So the British are coming down from Canada. They're headed toward Albany, New York. They have 6,000 soldiers. They recapture Fort Ticonderoga. And um, the British General Johnny Burgoyne meets with the Mohawk Indians and promises them money for scalps. And so the Mohawk go in front of the British Army and scalp Americans. I mean, there's stories where 30 guys would go out at nighttime to do reconnaissance, and three would come back. Because the Indians were so good in the woods, they could catch, catch them and kill them. And then they would scalp them. And, uh, and so the one story was a British loyalist, another loyalist, right? And he lives in a New York settlement, and he has, is engaged to his fiancée, Jane McRae. And 
he kisses her goodbye and says, I'm going to go up and join British General Johnny Burgoyne. We're going to come down here, drive out these rebels, and then we'll get married, have a great life. Well, the, the problem is the Indians couldn't tell who was a faithful American and who was a loyal British. We all sort of look the same to them, right? And so the Indians are attacking and scalping and attacking and scalping. And um, one night they come into the camp and they're hollering, doing their scalp dance, right? They put the scalps on the stick and they're holding it up and they're dancing around. And uh, the one soldier is a, a, a British soldier, David Jones. He sees this nice long scalp, you know, beautiful red, reddish blonde hair. And it's, it's, they're really close to the settlement where his fiance was. And he's like, uh, <laughs> that's it. It was his fiance, uh, Jane McRae. And the Indians couldn't tell that, you're right. And so they, um, they captured her and one wanted her and the other wanted her and they were fighting over her and the one just took her and scalped her right there and, and they put her on their little stick and did their dance. And, and so, um, so when Johnny, Ber when, um, excuse me, David Jones tells the other soldiers, they go to this British general and say, what were you thinking? And so this British general, Johnny Burgoyne, has to meet with the Mohawk Indians and he has to tell them to tone it down. Now, the Indians don't know tone it down. They know on and off. They're at peace, they're at war. They don't know any limited warfare stuff. You know, we would send our guys over to Iraq, Afghanistan, and, and say, now, don't shoot at them when they're walking across the street. Wait till they all get set up again. Then, then you, it's like, the Indians don't know that. They're at peace or they're at war. If it's war, it's total. So they get offended and leave. And now you have an entire British army in the middle of the New York forest, and they don't know where they're at. The Indians had been their eyes and ears and their reconnaissance. And so now suddenly the Americans get the advantage. And the Americans surround them and force them to surrender. And this is a big deal. This would, it would be a big deal today if 6,000 troops somewhere on the planet surrendered. And so uh, it ricochets around the world. And Ben Franklin is in Paris lobbying the king of France to get in the war. He's not in a hurry to get in the war because he lost the French and Indian War. And right, everything, you know, east of the Appalachians and, you know, the British took away from the French. And uh, so, so Ben Franklin goes in there and says, we just captured 6,000 British. And so the king of France is like, well, maybe I'll get in the war. And um, Lord George Washington writes to his younger brother, John Augustine Washington, I most devoutly congratulate my country and every well-wisher to the cause on this signal stroke of providence. So Washington is crediting God. Well, after the battle, the Continental Congress declares the first national day of Thanksgiving, right? After the declaration had been declared. And it says, with one heart and one voice, join the penitent confession of their manifold sins that it may please God through the merits of Jesus Christ mercifully to forgive and blot them out and under the providence of almighty god secure for these united states the greatest of all human blessing independence and peace and i think it's amazing that the first day of thanksgiving after the declaration says through the merits of jesus christ and um so now uh, the next year george washington is at valley forge what's that so the the british general a uh, gauge um that came to uh, supposed to capture Brooklyn and was supposed to go up the Hudson. He went and he captured Philadelphia. And so George Washington and the Americans are chased out of Philadelphia and they're now in the woods. It's called Valley Forge. And they suffer through a winter. The next spring, George Washington gives the order to the distinguished character of patriot. It should be our highest glory to laud the more distinguished character of Christian. And then uh, the next year, some of the Indians, called the Delaware Indians, decide to bring some of their youth to Washington to be trained in American schools. And Washington said, you do well to wish to learn our arts and way of life, and above all, the religion of Jesus Christ. So this is George Washington saying this. So the hero of the Battle of Saratoga was Benedict Arnold. And he uh, had a little temper and got upset at people that, uh, he didn't think he had enough courage and so forth. 
And so he got on the wrong side of his general at Valley Forge, I mean, excuse me, at Battle of Saratoga. So, so the general or, orders Benedict Arnold to sit in his tent on the day of battle. And I mean, here's this guy, he's like, I want to fight, I want to fight. And everybody else is fighting. He's being ordered to sit in his tent, twiddle his thumbs. And he can't take it any longer. So he takes a swig of whiskey and he rides off and he sees the British have an exposed flank aside. And so he leads a charge across and he captures this redoubt. He's shot in the leg, um, but he is considered the hero of the Battle of Saratoga. So all the glory of winning Saratoga, Benedict Arnold's the man. And everybody like respects him, even George Washington. He was like more popular than George Washington for a while. And so, um, uh, but uh, because he had a temper, uh, he gets passed up for some promotions. Other people are being made generals and he's being passed over. And so, um, but meanwhile, he's made, the, the Americans drive the British out of Philadelphia and he's made the military governor of Philadelphia, Benedict Arnold. Well now, while the British were in Philadelphia for that seven, eight months, they left some spies when they withdrew. And one of the spies was a Major John Andre, but he dressed and pretended like he was an American. And, uh, and he became friends with this woman named Peggy Shippen. Well, now Peggy Shippen was a young lady and um, she, uh, her dad was a loyalist and her dad was a wealthy businessman in Philadelphia. And they would put on parties for the British but now the British are out and they would put on parties for Benedict Arnold. And so here's Benedict Arnold, this, this war hero. They're having parties, he's got his leg, he's sort of recuperating. And she, Peggy Shippen, takes a liking to Benedict Arnold. And uh, they fall in love and they end up getting married. And she wants a big house, he doesn't really have money and so he's in charge of confiscating stuff for the war effort and there's an accusation that he's selling some stuff on the side to make a little money so that he can have this nice house for his new wife. And uh, he has to go through a trial, a court martial. And they, they find him not guilty, but this trial drags on for so long. Meanwhile, he's getting passed over for promotions. And Peggy Shippen begins to tell him, she said, you know what, if you were in the British Army, um, if you were in the British Army, they wouldn't treat you like that. Um, she said, you know, uh, she starts, and she's out working on him for like a year. She's like um, telling him, you know, uh, I, I know some British Army guys. And so she ends up um, putting her husband, Benedict Arnold, in touch with John Andre, the spy. And after a year, she finally gets him to cave. These Americans don't appreciate you. You're such a great general, and they passed you over for promotion. They're wanting to put you on trial, and how terrible they are. And he finally caves, and he agrees to meet with the British spy, John Andre. And by this time, Benedict Arnold has been made in charge of West Point. Now, West Point is the biggest military base in America. It's on the Hudson River, which goes north and south, cutting New York in half, but also cutting America in half because the New England colonies are on one side and the Middle Southern colonies are on the other. And, uh, and so this, uh, that's the point in the river, right? So this is the point going out into the, the Hudson River. That's at West Point today. And so, um, so John Andre, the spy, meets with Benedict Arnold and um, was going to get on a boat and go back down the Hudson, but some Americans shoot some guns and so the British leave. And so Benedict Arnold says, okay, John, uh, come back home with me and um, has him dress in some civilian clothes and then so you can just sneak back to, to New York. Well, the rules of war are if you're captured and you're in a uniform, you're treated as a prisoner of war and they keep you alive because they want to trade you for prisoner exchange with other prisoners. But if you are captured, dressed as a civilian, you're a spy and you immediately get hung. And uh, historians wonder why would Benedict Arnold do something so foolish as to have this British guy dress as a civilian and walk back? And some think that Benedict Arnold was maybe a little jealous that John Andre was this handsome guy and he was keeping this really close relationship with his wife and who knows, but it, there was something there. And so, so here's John Andre dressed as a civilian, walking back across the American land, walking past the no man's land, and he's coming up to the British territory 
And there's one bridge left, but before he crosses the bridge, some German Hessian troops come out of the woods. Now, the Hessians were Germans hired by the King of England to fight America. If Benedict Arnold had kept his mouth shut, he could have made it across the bridge. But he blurts out, it's finally good to see some men on our side. And the Hessian soldiers say, uh, uh, what do you mean our side? Well, you're Hessians, you're with the British. And they go, no, 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 we're American soldiers dressed as Hessians to try to catch people that maybe are lying and so forth. And he's like, you know what, I, I sort of knew that. I, you can't never tell nowadays. And he, he tries to talk his way out of it. And they say, well, you know, let's just search you. They search him once, they search him twice. They're about to let him go when they decide to search him a third time. And they say, hey, why don't you take off your boot? And hanging in the stocking is the map of West Point. And they're like, oh, you didn't tell us about this map. Oh, yeah, the map. Yeah, and he tries to talk his way out of it. Right there, he's got his boot off. And there they are looking at the map. And uh, here's another painting, right? He's got his boot off, and they're looking at the map. They're said, and they say, you know what? We're just going to take you back to uh, explain it to our commanding officer. And while they're going back, the word spreads ahead. And Benedict Arnold is waiting at West Point. He's thinking these British troops are going to come up. And... Uh, and his men come in and say, Benedict Arnold, th th we caught this spy. He had a map of your fort. He was about to betray your fort. And Benedict Arnold's like, uh, wait right here. And he flees. He goes down to the river. There was a British ship waiting called the Vulture. He gets on it and sails away. And um, anyway, the next, the next day, George Washington had planned on visiting West Point. And so not only would West Point have been captured, George Washington would have been there and he would have been captured. And so the General Nathaniel Green says, treason of the blackest eye was yesterday discovered. General Arnold, who commanded at West Point, was about to give the American cause a deadly wound, if not fatal stab. Happily, the treason had been timely discovered to prevent the fatal misfortune. The providential train of circumstances which led to its discovery affords the most convincing proof that the liberties of America are the object of divine protection. Yale President Ezra Stiles writes, a providential miracle at the last minute detected the treacherous scheme of traitor Benedict Arnold, which would have delivered the American army, including George Washington himself, into the hands of the enemy. The Continental Congress is so happy they have another day of Thanksgiving. A remarkable interposition of his watchful providence in the rescuing the person of our commander-in-chief and army from imminent danger at the moment when treason was ripened for execution. It is therefore recommended a day of public thanksgiving and prayer to confess our unworthiness and to offer fervent supplications to the God of all grace to cause the knowledge of Christianity to spread over all the earth. I just think it's amazing. We thank God Washington wasn't captured. And we're going to thank God that West Point wasn't captured. Oh yeah, we want to thank God for the, the knowledge of Christianity to spread over all the earth. All right? And... Um, so now we're getting close to the end of the revolution, and there's a battle of cow pens. This, you have some cows, you put them in a pen, <laughs> and, um, and it's in um, uh, South Carolina, and the, uh, the British have a uh, Colonel Tarleton, and he's nicknamed the Butcher. If you saw the movie with Mel Gibson, and there's this Colonel Tarleton, and he's like killing people in a butcher, well that's, so um, this Colonel Tarleton is 26 years old, and he's, you know, connected family-wise. And the British, they would give rank not based on your ability, but on your political connections, right? And so he's, he, his family had some political connections, and he got made colonel. But he's over these dragoons, which are, they're like Marines. They're like really tough soldiers, and they're riding on horseback called the light cavalry because they could ride really light and fast, and they had sabers, and the sabers were swords that were really sharp. And at a full gallop, they could like slice people and stab people. And, and you can't outrun a horse. And uh, so there's the Battle of Waxhaw. It's, uh, where is it? Well, it's W-A-X-Y-A, -A, but it's Waxhaw. And um, it, in this particular battle, the Americans were losing and then surrendered. And Colonel Tarleton, has his men pull out their sabers and hack 300 Americans to death who are in the process of surrendering. 
And there's the picture of them. See the bridge right there, sabers out, and they're hacking, 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 and these Americans are like, wait, wait. And so this is when Colonel Tarleton got the nickname The Butcher. So, Battle of Calpins. So T Colonel Tarleton, 26-year-old guy, riding with his dragoons, and he's chasing uh, the Americans. And uh, the Americans have a general named Daniel Morgan. And uh, if you saw the movie, The Patriot, he's in there, you know. And uh, he realizes he cannot, his army can't move very fast, so he cannot outrun these dragoons, so he's going to have to fight. But he decides to pick the place. And he sets up in front of a river. Now, you never fight a battle in front of a river. Because if you're losing, it makes it really hard to run away. And so it looked foolish. But Daniel Morgan was setting a trap. And so he had two groups of men. He had the militia. These are guys that are right off the farm. They're good shots, but they're known for shooting a couple times and running away. And behind them, sort of hiding, are the Continental soldiers who fought in lots and lots of battles. They are courageous, and they are not going to run away. So the British see the Americans, this Colonel Tarleton. He sees them set up in front of a river, sees a bunch of these militia guys, and he basically says, this is going to be like the Battle of Waxhaw. Guys, pull out your sabers, and he has them charging. And they've been, they've been riding for 24 hours nonstop. He doesn't do reconnaissance and like check. He just tells his men charge. And so the, the British are charging. These militia guys, they shoot once, boom. They hurry up and they reload. They shoot twice, boom, and then they run away. But it was planned. And so the, the blue, the red coats are the British. And, and here's these guys, the militia, they shoot and then they run away. And then the Continental soldiers act like they're gonna run away but suddenly they stop and they turn on their heels and they level their rifles at point blank range and pull the trigger and boom, a hundred British dragoons drop dead. And the guys that ran away, they just come around and attack the British from the other side. They're like, whoa, and 800 of the British throw down their weapons and surrender. The Colonel Tarleton rides off and when news gets to Lord Cornwallis that his dragoons had been killed and captured, Cornwallis was leaning on his sword he leaned so hard, the sword snapped in half. He was furious. And so he decides he's going to chase the Americans. And so they're chasing the Americans across the Catawba River. And uh, the Americans cross. But before the British can cross, can cross, there's a flash flood. And the river rises really fast over its banks. And the British are delayed for several days. And uh, then he crosses the Catawba River, and he's, he wants to move his army faster, but he's got these slow supply wagons. And so he wants to leave them behind, but he doesn't want the Americans to get the supplies, so he burns them, and they trash all their supply wagons, and now he can move faster, and they come up to the Yadkin River. And the Americans cross the Yadkin River, the British show up, but suddenly there is another storm. The Yadkin River overflows its banks, and the British are delayed again. And then it, here's the, the map. So the red coats are the British. All right, there's the blue, and they keep crossing these rivers. And then they come uh, to the Dan River. And the Americans cross. The British show up, and they're watching the Americans get out the other side. But before the British can start crossing, another flash flood. And uh, here's the historical marker. Boyd's and Irwin's ferries to the west were used by Nathaniel Green in his passage of Dan River in mid-February 1781 while Cornwallis was in close pursuit. And so the one British uh, commander, Henry Clinton, writes, here the Royal Army was again stopped by a sudden rise of the waters, which had only just fallen, almost miraculously, to let the enemy over, who could not else have eluded Lord Cornwallis's grasp, so close was he upon their rear. Right? This was like an amazing miracle that allowed... Now, what happened was the British had an army with no supplies because they trashed them all. And um, Yale President Ezra Stiles says, should we not ascribe to a supreme energy, talking about God, the wise generalship displayed by General Green, who had t joined uh, Daniel Morgan, leaving the roving Cornwalls to pursue his helter-skelter, ill-fated march into Virginia. 
George Washington writes, we have abundant reasons to thank Providence for its many favorable interpositions in our behalf. It has at times been my only dependence for all other resources seem to have failed us. And so these are just some of the stories in there. And uh, so in 1854, a representative, James Meacham, wrote, down to the revolution, every colony did sustain religion in some form. It was deemed peculiarly proper that the religion of liberty should be upheld by a free people. Had the people during the revolution had a suspicion of any attempt to war against Christianity, that revolution would have been strangled in its cradle. I mean, here are these people calling upon God, giving God thanks, having days of thanksgiving to Jesus Christ. And if you would have told them, hey, someday they're going to want to have schools where they're going to outlaw Jesus and outlaw God and outlaw the Bible, it says that revolution would have stopped right then. Right? And uh, so I have a chapter in the book uh, of the courageous women during the revolution. Women sort of get forgotten. And uh, Calvin Coolidge gave an address to the daughters of the American Revolution. And he says, the importance of women in the working out the destiny of mankind, as there were fathers in our republic, so were their mothers. Coolidge says, by their abiding, abiding faith, they inspired and encouraged the men. By their sacrifice, they performed their part in the struggle out of which came our country. So the women were called camp followers. But that term doesn't do them justice, because they were the ones that took care of the wounded, scavenged for food, got the water, brought the water to the men. Um, they sewed the uniforms. They patched everything up. I mean, they did all that stuff. There was no, like, ambulances. There was no medic tents. There wasn't any of that. And uh, so at Valley Forge, uh, you had 2,500 soldiers die, but there were 500 women that died at Valley Forge. And um, so they, they were doing all the work, washing the clothes and, and all these things. Uh, Calvin Coolidge said, we've been told of the unselfish devotion of the women who gave of their own warm garments to fashion clothing for the suffering Continental Army during that bitter winter at Valley Forge. The burdens of the war were not all borne by men. And so there's Lucy Knox, the wife of Colonel Henry Knox, and she's helping to organize uh, help for these men, is the camp following women. Katie Green, wife of General Nathaniel Green. And uh, one of the ladies, Mrs. Westlake, described Martha Washington. I never in my life knew a woman so busy from early morning until late at night as was Lady Washington, providing comforts for the sick soldiers. And by the way, this continued even through the Civil War. I mean, here's Clara Barton, a school teacher, and she organizes, right, the American Red Cross, and she's like taking care of the wounded soldiers during the Civil War. And um, Esther Reed, wife of Officer Joseph Reed, and Sarah Franklin Bach, daughter of Ben Franklin, organized the Ladies of Philadelphia. And they raised $300,000 for General Washington to buy warm clothes for the American troops. And then um, some of the ladies, like Lucy Knox, left their loyalist British families, never to see them again. And they sailed back to England. And uh, the women had to join their husbands on these military assignments, shifting encampments. Uh, the Knoxes, Henry and Lucy, didn't have a permanent home till they were married 20 years. Uh, Calvin Coolidge goes on, who has not heard of Molly Pitcher, whose heroic services at the Battle of Monmouth helped the sorely tried army of George Washington? And so Molly Pitcher's real name was Martha Ludwig and uh, Hayes, and she was one of the camp followers. And during the heat of the battle, the women would get water, and then go from trench to trench, giving water to the men. And since she had the water in a pitcher, they called her Molly Pitcher. And, uh, and then the water was also used to swab the cannons. So you shoot a cannon, and it gets really hot. And if you don't take a stick with, dip it in water and run it through the cannon to cool it down, the, the, the metal will eventually melt, and then the cannon's useless. And so they would swab the cannons. And um, so the story is that... Uh, Molly Pitcher's husband was in charge of swabbing the cannon and helping to load the cannon. And it's really hot this day. It's like over 100 degrees, and he faints of heat stroke. And so uh, she puts down her pitcher and then takes his place loading the cannon. And uh, uh, it's the Battle of Monmouth outside of Philadelphia, June 28, 1778. And uh, there's an American postage stamp with her loading the cannon there. And uh, lots of 
paintings because it was a very famous story. And at one point, a cannonball from the British flew between Molly Pitcher's legs, tearing off the bottom of her petticoat. And Molly remarked, well, that could have been worse, and went back to load the cannon. <laughs> And another soldier documented it. Uh, Joseph Plum Martin writes, a woman whose husband belonged to the artillery who was then attached to a piece in the engagement attended with her husband at the piece while in the act of reaching a cartridge, having one of her feet as far before the other as she could step, a cannon shot from the enemy passed directly between her legs without doing any other damage than carrying away all the lower part of her petticoat. Looking at it with apparent unconcern, she observed that it was lucky it did not pass a little higher, for in that case it might have carried away something else and continued her occupation. <laughs> <laughs> Hearing of her courage, General Washington commended Mary Ludwig Hayes, issuing her a warrant as a non-commissioned officer, and she was called Sergeant Molly. And uh, there's the historical marker in Philadelphia to Molly Pitcher. And, uh, Another lady with a similar story was, story was Margaret Cochran Corbin, wife of artilleryman John Corbin. And um, this is uh, 28 Continental soldiers are defending Manhattan's Fort Washington, attacked by 9,000 of those German Hessian troops. Uh, she, her husband gets killed, and she takes up loading the cannon, and she even gets wounded. And um, she helps to fight the rest of the battle. And after the war, uh, she becomes the first woman to be awarded a military pension, Mary Corbin. And, uh, and then the husbands left town to fight, and the women had to take care of the farm, had to take care of the families, had to take care of fighting the, <laughs> the Indians that got stirred up by the British. And um, so when the men of Pepperell, Massachusetts went off to war, Prudence Cumming Wright and Sarah Shaddock formed their own militia of women to protect the town. It was called Mrs. David Wright's Guard. And their weapons were everything from muskets to farm tools. And, uh, and so the women would do all of this, and uh, they even organized resistance protests. What's that? Well, you would buy cloth from the British factories. Um, but when they protested buying stuff from Britain, that meant the women had to go back to the spinning wheels. And here's the picture of the woman with the spinning wheel, right? And you take the wool from the sheep, and then you would put them together, and the little microscopic hairs of the sheep wool would grab together, so the more you pull it, the thinner it gets, and it gets stronger, so they have to put it on these things. A lot of work just to make a thread. And, um, but they were doing this because they didn't want to buy stuff and give money to the British. Some of the women engaged in riskier roles as messengers, scouts, spies, saboteurs, and if they were caught, the punishment was immediate hanging, right? Because they weren't wearing a uniform. Uh, there was a Catherine Kate Moore Berry, heroine of the Battle of Calpins. We talked about the Battle of Calpins. She rode through the back trails of South Carolina to warn of advancing British troops, round up militia, including her husband, to join General Daniel Morgan for the Battle of Calpins. And uh, there's a historical marker to Kate Berry. So she was like a, Patrick, uh, a um, Paul Revere. Now, there's another Paul Revere type of person. It's a 16-year-old girl named Sybil Ludington. And on the night of April 26, 1777, she rides 40 miles through Putman and Dutchess counties, waking up the Patriots to join the militia led by her father, Colonel Henry Ludington. And there's a statue of Sybil Ludington. And there's a historical marker. Sybil Ludington rode horseback on this road the night of April 26, 1777 to call out uh, Colonel Ludington's regiment to repel the British. And uh, anyway, there's even a postage stamp with Sybil Ludington on it. And then there's Lydia Derrick. Are these stories interesting? Yeah. They're ones that you don't normally hear about. So the British would quarter in your home. What's that? Um, they didn't have barracks all around America, and so they would sleep in American houses. And so the British soldiers would come up to your house, they would walk in your house, they would go into your bedroom, and they would take it over, they would go into your kitchen and tell you to cook them food, and they would just take over. And you'd have to, like, live in the attic or the basement or the barn. And so the Quakers were known for being nonviolent, and so the British thought that they could, you know, be there and not have to worry about stuff, so they take 
this a lady named Lydia Derrick, and they're quartering in her home. And she uh, listens through the wall and hears the British plans. And she wrote them down on little pieces of paper and wadded them into balls and sewed them in little felt you know, cloth buttons on her son's vest. And then told her son to go out and meet with Washington's men and they clipped off the buttons and they took the buttons to George Washington who unfolded them, pulled out the pieces of paper and it saved Washington from an ambush at White Marsh. I mean, it saved Washington's life. They were, they were planning on capturing Washington right here and shooting him and like, so, so that's Lydia Derrick. And then uh, another's Deborah Champion. She's 22 years old. Her father, Henry Champion, is the Commissary General of the Continental Army. He's the one that gets all the supplies. And um, uh, Henry Champion needed to get a message to George Washington, but the British controlled all the roads and they had checkpoints. And so Deborah Champion dressed up as an old lady with a big bonnet and she hid the important papers in the, um, uh, her skirt. It was uh, the bodice of her Lindsay Woolsey dress. And, um, and so she was risking her life to get these messages to George Washington. Um, another is Anna Smith Strong. She was part of the Culper spy ring. What's that? So remember I, I talked at the beginning about that battle of New York, Brooklyn Heights, and all the har harbor filled with trees, and, and uh, the British did capture New York, and Washington did escape, but the British now controlled New York. And Washington's wondering, what are they going to do next? And so they're just like the Brit British left John Andre hanging around Philadelphia, in New York, there were some Americans that hung around, even though the Americans left. And they, these formed this, the Culper spy ring. And so you had one guy would sort of act like he was a loyalist and would listen, sort of overhear British talking. And when he felt like he had some important news, he would go to a bar and tell the bartender who was part of it. And he would tell um, Anna Strong Smith, we got some information, we got to get it to Washington. And she would go on the hill and uh, hang up her laundry. But it had been agreed ahead of time that if she hung up her laundry with certain colors in certain places, that across the water, the Americans looking through the telescope could see, hey, there's some information ready for us. And then at nighttime, they would row across and they would meet and they'd get the information and take it to George Washington. Who would think that a woman hanging her laundry <laughs> was part of it, saving George Washington with this Culper spy ring? And, um, and then there's some interesting ones. Uh, Nancy Hart. So her husband is off fighting, and the British come to her farmhouse and want to do the quartering thing. We're going to stay here, and you're going to cook food for us. And they shoot her prized turkey and say, okay, cook it for us. And she's not real happy about that, but she, uh, she decides to go ahead and cook it, and she decides to serve him some corn whiskey and just get him sort of happy and sort of distracted. And meanwhile, she's, she's taking their muskets and she's like walking across the room and putting them in, in a corner far away from where they are and where her daughter is sort of hiding. And then she would take another putt musket and she'd give him some more whiskey. To take. And then when the last musket, the British guy saw her and he gets up and starts coming toward her and the daughter cocks the musket, hands it to the mom, boom, knocks, kills the guy. <laughs> Another guy starts coming toward her, the daughter cocks the next musket, hands it to the mom, she boom, shoots the other guy. And before the other guy comes, the daughter cocks another one, hands it to her, and, and the guy's like, okay, okay. <laughs> and she holds them at bay. So here's the picture. There's the daughter there hiding with the musket. There's the Nancy Hart, and there's the cadet guy. And, uh, and she holds them at gunpoint until her husband comes back, and she insists that all the rest of them get hanged. <laughs> and then they get buried. And it was just the story until in 1912, the railroad was coming by the Hart farm doing excavating and they uncover six nicely neat graves with British soldier bodies in them. So it's a true story. And um, anyway, uh, so in 
So British Empire, it's the biggest empire on planet Earth. We had this ragtag that we were throwing together to try to drive them out. We believed that the government should be bottom up by the people, not top down by uh, a globalist king. And uh, then I'm gonna skip ahead to the War of 1812. And uh, matter of fact, um, maybe I'll take a little break and, uh, and we'll come back with the War of 1812. These are really interesting stories uh, that, that you won't want to miss. So um, I'm going to give it, give it to Pastor Adam here. Did you like this? Yes, this excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Federer. Very interesting stories about history that you don't hear every day, for sure. So what we're going to do now is we're going to just uh, take a moment to uh, just take an offering to help support William Federer. And I understand while the ushers are getting uh, the bags ready, I understand that you can donate electronically uh, by going to AmericanMinute.com. Is that correct? And clicking on donate. And on that website, AmericanMinute.com, you'll also find um, all of his books or many of his books and resources that are available. Now, we do have a table in the back. And... Um, there aren't a ton of resources back there because most of them have sold out over the past few days. Uh, but there is the ability from the back to purchase resources and have them mailed to you, books and other things uh, that re recollect some of this history. Uh, but this is only a snippet of um, everything that he's talked on and written about, um, which is uh, fairly large in volume. So. Um, so those are the options, the ways to give. You can also, if you'd like to, um, tonight, if you'd like to donate, if you'd like to write a check, etc., you can write it to William Federer, and that'll go directly to him. And so everything that we collect tonight will be in support of his ministry. And we're just going to say a prayer, and then I'm going to give the ushers a chance to pass the bag. So Heavenly Father, we thank you uh, for, again, for your hand on our lives, Lord. Lord, we thank you for the privilege of living in this country in this day and age and the privilege to worship you. And Father God, we just pray that you would uh, bless and multiply this offering in Jesus' name. Amen. So while the bags are being passed, um, you know, I did want to mention if you're new here to this facility, we do have restrooms and they are right outside these double doors if you jog directly to the right. The restrooms, men and ladies rooms, are on the left-hand side. And so feel free, if you need to use the restroom, you can. Uh, we'll be going until approximately 8 o'clock or so uh, tonight. And then we'll close up and we'll have some refreshments, including uh, some coffee and some cookies. Now, I want to give you a chance to recharge as much as you need to catch your breath. And then we're going to do just a short Q&A. And so there'll be the opportunity to ask any questions that you like of relevance. And I will uh, just simply carry this mic around. If you have a question, uh, just lift up your hand. And are you comfortable going straight into that now? Or would you like to? Okay. Excellent. Okay. So we're going to do this. We're going to enter into a Q&A. So any questions? For Mr. Federer, not for me. <laughs> All right, Howard Spear, let me bring the mic over to you. What's the best thing that the average citizen can do to encourage people to truly follow the Lord and save the freedom in our country? Uh, well, part of it would be talking to everyone that we can. Um, one of the things I found interesting was... Um, praying that God would bring opportunities across our path in the course of a day. Um, years ago, I talked to somebody from China, and they uh, talked about where um, when the communists came in, they bulldozed the churches and uh, chased out the missionaries, and they dust their hands and said, that's it, we took care of the Christians. But before the, that, some of the Christian pastors had taught the building's not the church, you're the church. And they said, pray for uh, God to give you opportunities to witness because it's now illegal to be on the radio and pass out tracts. And so they taught five things. One, um, listen for people in the course of your day who cross your path that have needs. Number two, do the best you can to meet the need. 
Number three, become that person's friend, right? Follow up with them. Number four, introduce them to some of your other Christian friends. And finally, introduce them to your friend, Jesus. And tells a story of a high rise with, you know, they have all those china, they pack them in, and one of the floor was the laundry floor. And the lady heard crying, goes around the corner, she's a pregnant mom, she doesn't know how they're gonna survive, and she's like, and so she talks to her, and then she, she brings some groceries over to this, this young mother's house. And then kind of comes and checks up on her every couple days, you know, and then has some of her other Christian friends come by, have a baby shower and everything. And finally, this girl's like, why are you all being so nice to me? And they said, well, let us tell you about our friend Jesus. Now, that girl's not about to turn them into the communist authorities because they were her friend in her time of need. And that model, Christianity exploded in growth in China without radio, without televisions, without any of that stuff. And, uh, and so the, the takeaway is to pray and ask God to bring across your path in the, cro- in the course of your day somebody that, that you can witness to. Now, you have to have common sense. I mean, if you're a lady and there's a hitchhiker, you don't want to pick up the guy. You don't want to do th- foolish things. But if it's just, you know, in the course of your job and somebody has a need and you've got a couple extra minutes, you know, that's, that's one thought. So, but, uh, but definitely it's speaking. Yes? Excellent question. Let me bring the mic around for you, young man. All right. Um, out of all American history, what was the worst battle? What was the worst battle? Um, maybe D-Day, you know, uh, 9,000 were killed. Or um, there was the, what, the one in um, Okinawa, where it was uh, the largest amphibious invasion. Um, in fact, I don't know the number offhand, but lots of them died. Um, and the, and the Japanese had kamikaze planes and they were like smashing it. Like 300 ships of ours got sunk because they, they were doing that. It was really bad. I had an uncle that fought in that battle. And um, he said that they were like kamikaze and killing. And he, that they would have to find something to hide under. And he says the only thing it was, a, was a curb of the street. Right? I mean, they were lying down the curb trying to let the, the not get hit. Um, but a lot of guys, and the Japanese had this attitude that it was... Um, uh, dishonorable to surrender. This is the kamikaze where they would rather die before surrender. And so they were like all just, it was like really tough trying to, to win that battle. I don't know if that's one of them, but, but Okinawa and D-Day were, were two big ones. Great questions. Another question from a young man. Love to see the young man getting engaged here. What was the longest battle? Wow, that the longest battle. Uh, well, I mean, the D-Day, they called it Operation Overlord, and it went on for like a month. Um, you know, it was a whole campaign. There were some of them during the Civil War that lasted a long time. And Civil War, I mean, like 10,000 people would die in a day, and the next day they'd fight some more, and 10,000 more would die the next day. And it was like, it turned into a war of attrition. You know, it's just like the, the, the North got these immigrants coming over that they would take from Ireland and put them right into the army, but the South didn't have that, and so they have, the South lost. But, but those... Um, Th- those were long battles, but I'd, I'd have to do some homework to tell you the, that offhand. Yes, Pastor Josh. It, so the days of Thanksgiving that the Continental Congress uh, proclaimed or declared, was that related to, because I saw that was October and November, is that in any relation or in their mind, did they have the Pilgrim's Thanksgiving in their memory, and was the Pilgrim's Thanksgiving uh, at all celebrated in Massachusetts or nationally between 1620 and... Yeah, great question. Um, the, uh, the Pilgrims had a day of Thanksgiving. Uh, the, the Pilgrims were actually chased out of England and landed in Holland and went to Leiden, Holland. The Jews were actually chased out of Spain and went to Holland and settled in Leiden, Holland. And so the Jews had their Feast of Tabernacles at the end of the, the summer, right? And so there's a thought that the, the pilgrims may have gotten some idea of the Thanksgiving from the Jews. They did identify with the Jews. They said, you left the Pharaoh, we left the King of England, you crossed the Red Sea, we crossed the English Channel, you know. And that's why they taught Hebrew at Yale and Harvard, so they ident- So that's one thought. But as far as America, the, the colonies had this idea, when things were bad, you would have days of prayer. When things were real bad, you would have days of fasting and prayer. And when things turned around, you would have days of Thanksgiving. And it was this relationship with the Lord. One time there was a famine. They had a day of fasting. 
to some ships come into the harbor with supplies, and they said, cancel the fasting, we're having a day of Thanksgiving. <laughs> you know, so it was on, and so many states had annual days of fasting. Like in Connecticut, it was every Good Friday. Every year they would have a day of fasting. As far as the Thanksgiving goes, I think d different states did different things. Lincoln was the one who made Thanksgiving an annual event nationwide. And um, so, uh, uh, but the days of prayer, they would do it uh, mostly during the, the different war times. I think it was mostly um, in response to the victory of the battle, and it wasn't necessarily tied to the, to the end of the year harvest. So, but that's a really good question. And, um, Excellent. Let's go with maybe one or two more questions, if that's okay. All right. I'm over on this side now. <laughs> All right. What battle was America most successful in? Oh, the, what battle was America most successful in? Um, well, uh, let's see. Um, well, there's the, the battle, of, uh, battle of the Bulge, which is a really interesting one. And I, I may have it at the end of my presentation here. Um, but that's in, in Germany, where eight roads came together, and the, uh, the Nazis made, uh, they needed, rent, they were running out of oil. And they wanted to get to the port city called Antwerp, Holland. And uh, so they do what's called the Blitzkrieg, a lightning war. They, they like are being pushed back. And, they, and if you were to draw a line down the middle of Europe, it, and the, they, they pushed back, it would create a bulge. And so they called it the Battle of the Bulge. But they're making this mad dash, and, um, and they almost win. Uh, but then the Americans are courageous and stop them at the Battle of the Bulge. And I, I, I think I might have those slides in my presentation. If you, if you want, I can try to jump ahead. Let me see if I got those in there. Mm, got lots and lots and lots and lots of slides. There's no way I can get through them all. But there's a good one there. OK, here we go. Yeah, this is slides. So um, I did a book called The Faith of FDR. I literally read through every address he gave while he was in office. Uh, he was in office 12 years. He was a liberal back then, but since then, both the left and the right have sort of migrated to the left, so many of his statements are ones that even the right wouldn't say nowadays. And so he, um, uh, he gives these, he gave out Gideon's New Testaments to all the soldiers in World War II, right? And this is a picture of it. I have a copy, and it says, um, as commander-in-chief, I take pleasure in commending the reading of the Bible, who all served in the armed forces of the United States. Throughout centuries, men have found in the sacred book words of wisdom, its fountain of strength, signed Franklin D. Roosevelt. And uh, so the Battle of the Bulge, December 16th, 44, January 25th, 45, the Nazis amassed their three armies for an enormous attack against the Allies at the Ardennes Forest. And, uh, and there's the line going north and south, and then you can begin to see the bulge, and there's the bulge coming out. And um, uh, Eisenhower, by rushing out from his fixed defenses, the enemy may give us the chance to turn his great gamble into his worst defeat. Um, so I call upon every man of the Allies to rise now to new heights of courage with unshakable faith in the cause for which we fight. We will, with God's help, go forward to our greatest victory. And so we parachute in the 101st Airborne, but the, the Nazis moved so fast that now suddenly the, the Airborne is behind enemy lines. And they're at Baston, and they're surrounded. And the Nazi commander sends a message to the surrounded 101st Airborne commander, right, the U.S. Army General Anthony McAuliffe, and they say, you're surrounded, surrender. And General McAuliffe's answer was, nuts. <laughs> and it's like, you can imagine the German messenger coming, what does American say? He says, he says nuts. <laughs> And so the Germans, was that yes? Is that no? I'm not familiar with that word, right? And um, meanwhile, Patton is coming to the rescue, and he has the Third Army. But the army's pinned down because it's snowing, and the planes can't fly to give the army cover. And so uh, Patton is wanting to come to the rescue of the 101st Airborne, but can't. And so he gets his chaplain, James O'Neill, to compose a prayer. And if you saw the movie Patton, it's in there. And so uh, at first he's like, 
you're, you know, he says, I want you to write a prayer to have the sky, the weather clear. And the chaplain's like, well, I'm not really sure that's how it works. He goes, we'll do it anyway. And so, so they print the prayer on a quarter of a million index cards and pass it out to the entire army. So everybody's praying the prayer. And, and this is the card. Uh, my father-in-law, before he died, was in a nursing home, and the guy in the next room over had fought with Patton and actually had this card. And we took a picture of it. Um, and so uh, one side is the prayer, and then the flip side is his Christmas greeting to his troops, right? And so um, it says, um, Almighty and most merciful Father, we humbly beseech thee of thy great goodness to restrain these immoderate reigns. Hearken to us as soldiers to call upon thee. Establish thy justice among men and nations. Well, the next day, the sky clears, and Patton's army is able to come to the rescue. And uh, I've actually talked to some soldiers, I'm sure they passed away since then, uh, who were there. They said, first of all, it was freezing, freezing cold. Second of all, the Germans were running out of oil, uh, gas, and their tanks were coming and getting closer and closer. And they're going, Runk. and they stopped. And then the lid opens, clunk, clunk. Then the guy scurries out clunk, clunk, and runs away. And they were like, he said, it's just like a, a, a field away, like uh, 50 yards away. There are all these tanks, and they suddenly stop. And um, so it was really a miracle. And then Patton comes and, and rescues them. And uh, so there's the, the picture. So um, that, that's, uh, that's the battle. So I, I'm not sure if that was answering the question that you had, but it was a nice story anyway, right? And uh, uh, this is an interesting one. It's the uh, Apollo 13. So it's launched in space and an oxygen tank explodes and blasts off part of the, the the space module, right? And they're looking out the window, and uh, it's April 11th, 1970, and uh, they say, Houston, we've had a problem. <laughs> and uh, Mission Control identified an oxygen tank exploded, irreparably damaging the craft. Nixon is president, 1970. He has the nation observe a day of prayer. And so they're praying in Jerusalem, praying in Rome, praying all around the world. And um, uh, you know, they're stopping class at school and everybody's praying for Apollo 13. Here's a church in New York and somebody's going in and what does the sign say? It says, uh, today, special prayer for Apollo 13. It's like the whole world is focused on this and um, so they, the, the astronauts are able to piece together an oxygen filter made out of all kinds of scrap that was like there in the module and, and then they were able to transfer the electric charge from the lunar landing module, because they're not going to do any landing on the moon, they have to transfer the electric charge from the module into the main uh, command module, and then you know let go of the other one, and then they they had to steer the thing manually uh, and uh, to, to get back to Earth, and it tur turns out they're, they're looking like they're going to land next to a hurricane, and uh, and they you know come in and and um, you know then the the, the sound goes off because they're, when they're coming into descent at a certain place, the radio signals won't go, you know, and they're like, oh, they're going to come out of it. And then finally they land. And um, they have prayer on the deck of the ship. And if you saw the movie Apollo 13, um, it, it ends with them on the deck praying. And uh, I got a chance to, uh, to hunt with um, uh, Gary Sinise. He was the Lieutenant Dan. And, but he was also in the movie of uh, Apollo 13. And I said, how did you do those weightless, weightlessness scenes in there? And he goes, oh, the vomit comet. <laughs> Evidently, there's some plane that they take up to like, I don't know how many thousands of feet, and they let it drop. And he says, you have two minutes of weightlessness. And, um, and so they would hurry up and you know, film and then go up again and drop and go up again and drop. And, um, but, uh, but they end the movie with this prayer. And so uh, Nixon, says, we have learned of the safe return of our astronauts. I ask the nation to observe a national day of prayer and thanksgiving today. This event reminded us that in these days of growing materialism, deep down, there is still a great religious faith in the nation. He says, I think more people prayed last week than perhaps have prayed in many years in this country. We pray for assistance of God when faced with great potential tragedy. And so here they are praying on the deck of the aircraft carrier. And then this is interesting. 
So, so if you look at them real close, this is the picture from Houston, the control room, and they're praying in the control room, and look at the big screen with the camera. That's the, the astronauts on deck praying, and this is the cover of Time magazine. And uh, it says, astronauts praying after splashdown. And they even issued a little coin, Apollo 13, and it says, uh, when the whole world prayed. And, uh, and then there's Apollo 14, they left a microfilm copy of the King James Bible on the moon. And so they, they, they put it in a little frame here, um, but th they didn't leave the frame on the moon. Uh, but this little piece of paper, every little square is a page in the King James Bible. But it shrunk down so teeny tiny, but they left it in the module. And, uh, and there it is. Um, and then um, <coughs> Apollo 15, astronaut James Irwin spent three days on the moon and had the lunar rover. And I spoke last year at the Sarasota, Florida, 50th anniversary mayor's prayer breakfast. And um, at the prayer breakfast was the wife of James Irwin and the daughter of James Irwin. And she actually got up and said something. And um, she had a picture of the lunar rover. And she said on the dash, she said, see that, that little black square? She said, my father left a Bible on the dash of the lunar rover on the moon. And uh, anyway, um, so James Irwin uh, said, being on the moon had a profound spiritual impact on my life. Before I entered space with Apollo 15 mission on July of seven, 1971, I was a silent Christian. But I feel the Lord sent me to the moon so I could return to earth and share his son, Jesus Christ. And James Irwin said, Jesus walking on the earth is more important than man walking on the moon. <laughs> Isn't that a great quote? And, uh, and so I, um, uh, I could go through some more stories, but I wanted to, since I'm on the space uh, thing, uh, I, I mentioned it um, Saturday night, and many of you may have heard it, but many of you haven't. But it's a, a way I like to present the gospel. And, uh, and so the, the thing is, we've talked about God moving in prayer in times of crises, people turning to the Lord in times of crises. And we, are, we have crises today. We want to turn things around. But you know, even if we don't, I think the Lord is, is looking at us to, to see, are we going to turn to him? You know, heat can melt butter, but it can harden clay. So the crises causes some people to turn to the Lord, and it causes other people to get bitter and turn away from the Lord. We all go through crises. And, it, and we choose how we're going to respond to the crises. And um, anyway, so, so the thought is, why did God make us anyway? And, um, you know, in, uh, to, get, to get a thought, here's God. He exists for eternity. Eternity upon eternity upon eternity. There's never been a time when God has not existed. As far back as you think, you can go gazillions of years before that, and gazillions of years before that, and gazillions of years before There never was a time when he did not exist. He makes everything. It's not so much that he knows everything. It's impossible for him not to know everything. He literally is all-powerful. He literally created everything. To get an idea of how big God is, in 2003, they focused the powerful Hubble telescope on a spot in the sky where there was nothing. The spot was so teeny, it was the size of a grain of sand held at arm's length against the night sky. Nothing there. After 11 days, they developed the images. In that little spot where there was nothing was 10,000 galaxies with hundreds of billions of stars in each galaxy. And this is the picture. It's called the Hubble Ultra Deep Space Field. It is the furthest picture ever taken away from planet Earth. And recently, the James Webb Telescope took the same picture of that area. And you can see it even clearer because it sees through with infrared. Every dot you see is a galaxy with hundreds of billions of stars in each galaxy. And that's in this teensy, teensy little size of a grain of sand spot. And then they began to look at other directions and other directions, and they realized that this universe is immensely bigger than anybody ever had thought. Prior to 1924, 
The word galaxy and universe were synonymous for all practical purposes. Uh, it was Edwin Hubble, the astronomer at the Mount Wilson Observatory in Pasadena, California, with a 100-inch aperture telescope lens, and he spotted a little smudge called the nebulae that they thought was just space gas. And he like zoomed in on this smudge, and he saw that it was planets, that it was the Andromeda galaxy, two, two and a half uh, million light years from Earth. And all of a sudden they realized, gee, there's two galaxies. There's our Milky Way galaxy, now there's another one. But now they realize that there's gazillions of other galaxies. I mean, there's like trillions of them. And, uh, and I think they estimate now that there are trillion, trillion stars. I mean, I don't know how they can, can come up with that. So they began to look at other directions. And, uh, and light travels in waves, with blue being the shortest and fastest, and red being the slowest and longest. They saw a red shift, which means the galaxies are moving away from us. And so they now estimate the observable universe is 93 billion light years across. And get this, still expanding at the speed of light. And the largest star they found is Stevenson 2-18. It's a super gas giant. It's so large, if you were to place Stevenson 2-18 in our solar system, it would engulf the orbit of Saturn, the sixth planet from the sun. We're the third planet from the sun. Could you imagine one single star that enormous? And God made it all. He is infinitely powerful. What could you possibly offer this being that is so powerful? Why would he make you? Well, what's a galaxy anyway? It's a bunch of rocks. Hot rocks, cold rocks, vaporized rocks, molten rocks. A rock cannot love you. So at some time in eternity past, God said, been there, done that, I can make everything. He said, you know what, I would really like someone in my image that could love me. Now it gets interesting, because love by definition must be voluntary. The moment it's forced, it evaporates. If God were to force you in any way to love him, he himself would know he's forcing you to love him, and he would know your response is not a love response. So he will not force you to love him. God does not need your love. He's not incomplete in any way, and your love somehow completes it. No, he's complete all by himself. He doesn't need your love, but he wants it. Parents don't need the love of their children, but they want it. And you think we're made in God's image. What's the most important thing in your life? Well, somewhere near the top of the list, it's loving and being loved. You don't have a guy dying and saying, gee, I wish I would have spent more time at the office. No, it's tell my wife I love her, tell my kids I love them. If we're made in God's image and love is important to us, could it be that love is important to God? And, uh, and I, I, out of all the beings that God created, all the, everything God created, he loves everything he created, but he could never be loved back. Because love, by definition, must be voluntary. So in the framework of everything he controls, time, matter, space, energy, he created one little thing he doesn't control, your will. Now, he could control it if he wanted to, but that would defeat the very reason he made us different than everything else. Right? So he created our free will in the context of his sovereign will. And, um, and so the, uh, I looked up the word angel in the King James Bible. It appears 289 times. Never once does it say the angels love God. It says they worship him, they praise him, they glorify him. They smite his enemies, they deliver his judgments like the plagues in Egypt. They're messengers like the, the angel that appeared to Samson's mom or the angel that appeared to Mary. They're heavenly witnesses. Jesus says, confess me before men, I'll confess you before my father and the angels of God. Right? They're heavenly witnesses. Angels are mighty powerful, really smart, but they are not made in God's image, and Jesus did not die on the cross for angels. They are created for a purpose. They're ministering spirits under the heirs of salvation, right? They, they, they do God's will, but they're, they're, they're made for a different purpose. And look it up. There's no verse in the Bible 
where it uses the word love to describe an angel's relationship with God. Look up the word mankind. Love is all through there. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, right? Uh, because he has set his love upon me, therefore will I deliver him. Jesus rose from the dead and said, Peter, do you love me? We are beings created for the purpose of being able to love God, but for love to be love, it must be voluntary, so he'll never force us. Right? The moment he would force us to love him, he himself would know he's forcing us to love him, and he would know a response is not a love response. Right? So he will never force us. So, he, uh, so out of all the creation, we have the ability to love God back. I mean, the animals follow instinct. I mean, and, um, and so this, there's a second thing. God has to hide himself behind his creation because if he ever revealed himself to you in all of his omnipotent, universe-creating power, brighter than a trillion suns, your response, if you didn't melt, would be like the Apostle John, the book of Revelation, I fell at his feet, is dead. And it would be instant and instantaneous. In the presence of such power, and your response would be an involuntary response, not a voluntary love response. God's like, I can do involuntary responses all eternity long. I I've been there, done that. I'm interested in this love response. So he hides himself behind his creation. People say, if God's real, why doesn't he show himself? Because the moment he shows himself, your free will is gone. In the presence of such omnipotent power, your, your response is instant, instinctive. It's not free will. So um, I like to use the illustration. So imagine a billionaire has a son who goes to college. And uh, he flies in on his private jet, drives up in his Lamborghini. He's got gold rings, Rolex watch, fancy clothes. He's going to have every girl on campus wanting to meet him. But if he lays all that aside, drives up in a clunker, got holes in his jeans, the uppity girls are going to ignore him. But then there's a, a girl that likes to study with him in the library, and they eat together in the cafeteria, and they become friends. And she takes heat from the clique for hanging around this nobody guy. But she believes in him. They fall in love. They get engaged. And then he says, hey, I want to take you back to meet my dad. And they're like driving up to this castle mansion and the girl's like, whoa, you didn't tell me about all this. He knows that she loves him for him, not because of all of his stuff. Jesus laid aside all of his glory, came to earth, was born in a manger. It says in Isaiah 53 of the Messiah, there's, there's nothing in his countenance that would make us want to desire him. He only wants those that love him for him. Right? So he creates us as free will beings, hides himself behind his creation so we can have free will. I'll throw in another thing. God created light, and uh, light travels at 186,000 miles per second. And Einstein's theory of relativity is the closer you can travel approaching the speed of light, for you, time slows down. And if you could travel the speed of light, theoretically, for you, time would stand still. And since God created light, he's faster than light. So for God, time effectively stands still. We'll never comprehend that, but there is a verse in the Bible that says a day with the Lord is as a thousand years and a thousand years as a day. Imagine experiencing one day as if it was a thousand years. In other words, we're moving in like ultra slow motion compared to God. He exists in the ever present now. I am that I am. And so for him to create our reality, he has to create this space time, this, this little bubble where everything moves in really slow motion compared to him. Right? So we get to make our little free will decisions, but he can readjust every atom in the universe before it goes to the next frame so that his will is going to take place. So it's our little free will inside of this eternal sovereign control of him having control over time, over all. Does that make sense? If it doesn't make sense, that's okay. Uh, so God created us as free will beings, hides himself behind his creation. So we have the, an opportunity to use our free will. But there's a third thing. God is just, and he cannot help it, which means he has to judge every sin. 
if God does not judge a sin, by default, he is giving consent to the sin. Right? It's called the rule of tacit admission, T-A-C-I-T. And you've seen it in wedding ceremonies where the pastor says, okay, anybody that's against this wedding, speak now or forever hold your peace. So if you're silent, your silence is giving consent. Silence equals consent. And so if there are sins and God is not judging the sins and God is silent when there are sins, he, by silence, he's giving consent to the sin. And if God gives consent to one sin, one time, he denies his just nature. He denies himself. He ungods himself. He's kicked out of heaven. And he is not going to get kicked out of heaven. And he is not going to deny himself. And he is going to judge every sin. So he could never be loved back if he makes free will beings, gives us an opportunity, hides himself so we could use our free will. But if we step out of line one time, he still has to judge us because if he doesn't judge our sin, his silence is giving consent to the sin and he's denying himself and he's not going to deny himself. So he has to judge it. So he came up with a plan. And the plan is his own son would become the lamb and take the judgment in our place. Right? So only as a man could God hang on a cross and die for our sins. And, um, and so you think, well, how can one person's death pay for the sin of all of us? God is a just God, and there's billions of us, and we've all sinned, and we've all fallen short of the glory of God, and God is a just God, so he has to judge every one of us. How can one person's death pay for that? Jesus is divine, and he experienced death. It says that a day with the Lord is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as a day. Jesus experienced that day on the cross as if it was a thousand years. You know, I've read through the book of Revelation lots of times, still trying to figure it out. But one thing seems clear. It's God that's pouring out the vials of judgment. The angels blow the trumpet. The angels throw the censers down. The angels, you know, have the plagues. Why is that? Well, that's the final judgment. So God has to judge every sin he missed along the way. So you can't get 10,000 years into eternity and say, God, there was this sin way back then and you didn't judge it, you were silent. Uh, were you giving consent to the sin? Is there a part of you that's unjust that we didn't know about? Uh-uh. It says the smoke of their torment rises forever and ever and the angels cry out, righteous and true are your judgments, O Lord. Nobody's going to question for the rest of eternity that God judged sin but he won't have to do any more judging for the rest of eternity because that's the final judgment. But in that sense, Jesus experienced the book of Revelation judgment poured out on his head. He took the judgment for every sin that everybody would ever do upon himself on the cross, experienced that as if it was a thousand years. That's why you sweat in drops of blood. And I, I have a degree in accounting, so I like things that balance. An eternal being, Jesus, who's innocent, suffering for a finite, limited period of time, is equal to all of us finite, limited beings who are guilty, suffering for an eternal period of time. Let me say that again. An eternal being who's innocent, suffering for a finite period of time, is equal to all of us finite beings who are guilty, suffering for an eternal period of time. Infinity times finite equals finite times infinity. An unlimited being suffering for a limited period of time is equal to all of us limited beings suffering for an unlimited period of time. Jesus literally suffered the equivalent of eternal damnation in all of our places. And he's the only one who could have done it. And out of love for the Father and out of love for you and me, for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. He saw you and I worshiping him. Jesus became the Lamb and took the judgment for our sins. This way, you and I can approach this universe-creating, eternal, omnipotent, and completely just God without having to worry about being judged. The Lamb is His way to love us without having to judge us. Right? So we get to love him, and he loves us for the rest of eternity, and he does not have to judge us because all the judgment we deserve went on the lamb. And we are in Christ, and we're approaching him through the lamb. 
Here's a verse. It says, a thousand years is as yesterday to the Lord when it is past. Well, it's been 2,000 years since Jesus died on the cross. So for God the Father, he experiences it as if it was two days ago. So for the rest of eternity, to God the Father, Jesus' death on the cross will have just happened. So when we come before God in the name of Jesus, born again, Jesus living on the inside of us, he remembers Jesus died on the cross for us. And so this way, you and I can spend eternity with a just God and not have to be, worry about being judged. We can love him and he can love us. We can spend eternity with God. We will spend eternity with God. And so instead of you doing works, hoping to earn brownie points with God, you're already accepted by God through faith in Christ and his death on the cross. And then he fills you with the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity. And then the Holy Spirit reaches out through you to a lost and dying world. Right? And you're, it's the same good works, right? It's the same good works, but instead of you doing them, hoping to earn brownie points, he's doing the good works through you. Loving the unlovable, rescuing those unjustly de- sentenced to death, defending the defenseless, you know, feeding the poor, clothing the naked. And, and his yoke is easy and his burden's light. It's easy. And it's not just easy, it's fun. I mean, there's actually nothing more joyful and fulfilling in life than letting the Holy Spirit use you to love on people. So today, if you've not yet done it, put all your faith in Jesus. He is the Lamb, the Son of God, the second person of the Trinity, the only begotten Son of God. In the plan of redemption that was hidden from age, it was a hidden plan. It says, if the princes of this world had known, they never would have crucified the Lord of glory. The Apostle Paul calls it the mystery of salvation. It was a hidden plan. So Jesus came to earth, became the man, took the judgment for all of our sins, and then rose from the dead to prove he was who he said he was. And now we're in Christ, and it's a joyful message. So I'll turn it back over to Pastor. Beautiful. Thank you, William. And thanks be to God for the salvation that we have in Christ Jesus. I'm going to invite Evie to come. Um, Evie was instrumental in getting William Federer here to be with us uh, this evening. And so so wanted to, again, thank you for coming and spending uh, the evening with us. And um, Evie is going to close with any comments she may have and in prayer. Uh, but then, again, at the end here, once we dismiss, there are cookies and coffee, and Mr. Federer will hang around for a little bit, and so uh, if you'd like to say hello to him, uh, meet him, and ask him any questions if you'd like, <laughs> now might be your opportunity, so I'll hand it over to Evie. Yes, thank you so much for coming. This is a treat, not only for older, but also for younger, and all of us, so I just thank you for the encouragement to walk Um, to follow the Lord and to listen to his voice and to know who he is and all that you share it has really encouraged us so thank you for that let's go ahead and bow our heads and pray Lord Jesus I just thank you that your um, yoke is easy your your burden is light Lord Jesus I thank you that we have been so encouraged and so blessed by the words spoken tonight and I pray that we will let them sink in as we go home tonight And uh, we just praise you, Lord, for all that you have done, all the miracles you've done in our history, and that we can look back and learn from them. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that we have a choice to read and to learn and to become wiser. And we just choose that tonight. And we praise you and honor you for what you have done. Lord Jesus, we praise you and we pray for a safe drive tonight for all who have come and a safe flight for William Federer tomorrow as he flies home and bless him greatly, Lord Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right, thanks for coming out. Enjoy some coffee and tea and cookies. Be blessed.